books have withstood the test of time like Geoffrey Chaucer's wildly original trailblazing masterpiece, The Canterbury Tales. Still widely published, read, and discussed over 600 years after its original publication, The Canterbury Tales is not only a window into the past, but a powerful, funny, tragic, historical glimpse into life in medieval times. And it stands as one of the first books written in English, and its poetic prose style made the classic work in Middle English incredibly innovative. A story about storytelling, The Canterbury Tales depicts life, class, romance, social caste, gender, morality, and so much more, all in a hilarious, moving way that contextually still resonates with readers' modern sensibilities. To understand more about The Canterbury Tales, it's important to know more about its author, Geoffrey Chaucer. He was born in London in the 1340s, but the exact date of his birth is unknown. As a teenager, Chaucer worked as a royal page and later as an emissary for the king, and he traveled widely throughout Europe. These positions allowed him to meet people from various countries and social classes, becoming fluent in several languages in the process. The Canterbury Tales reflects Chaucer's unique and eclectic life experiences and are loosely based on real experience. Chaucer's choice to write the Canterbury Tales in the English language some say for the first time, set a precedent that generation upon generation of authors would follow for centuries to come. Understanding the Canterbury Tales can't really happen without discussing the societal context in which its many tales take place. For one thing, at the time of its writing, women were not treated as equals to men. And in fact, abuse, sexual or otherwise, was widely accepted. The Virgin Mary was the image of female perfection, while Eve, who tempted Adam to eat the forbidden fruit in Eden, brought sin into the world. Men held all the power, and when women did have even a little of it, it was because their husbands gave it to them, or died, leaving it to them. Another problematic, but contextually important, element of the Canterbury Tales is anti-Semitism. Despite the fact that medieval popes taught tolerance for Jewish people, Christians at this time were quite anti-Semitic. In fact, one tale incorporates blood libel, which involved the false belief that Jews ritually murdered children to drink their blood. Critics have debated whether or not Chaucer himself was anti-Semitic, but the inclusion of the troubling ideology shows just how prevalent it was in Chaucer's time. The relationship between society and the church is key to understanding the period, too. The Roman church was the sole Christian authority in Europe, and its corruption was widespread. Amidst the angry calls for reform, the Bible was translated from Latin to English so that Christians could commune with God directly, without priests. The noble class didn't like this any more than the church did, causing tension among the classes. Change was coming, however, and the three traditional social estates, clergy, nobles, and peasants, were threatened by an emerging middle class of merchants and tradesmen. Perhaps most intriguing is the fact that the Canterbury Tales exists at all because there was no audience for such a major work when it was composed. English was not yet widely accepted as a written language. Writing the Canterbury Tales in Middle English meant that Chaucer was on the cutting edge of literary innovation. Printing with movable type hadn't been invented yet, so Chaucer probably shared some of his tales orally with fellow civil servants and scholars. The writing of the Canterbury Tales coincides with the rise of writing in English itself, and the proliferation and documentation of storytelling is an essential element of the book. The Canterbury Tales wasn't just a famous story. It was the famous story, the one that set the stage for a culture of reading that continues to this day. In the decades after Chaucer's death, around 100 copies of his tales were created, making it a bestseller by the standards of the time. As for the plot, The Canterbury Tales is a story within a story. And sometimes even all that is within yet another story. Anyway, every tale contains its own structure of introduction, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution, which is often a cautionary lesson or moral. The 24 tales are bookended by a prologue and retraction. In the overall story, within which all other stories are told, the introduction presents Chaucer, Harry Bailey, an innkeeper, and pilgrims who meet at Bailey's Tabard Inn, en route to the Canterbury Cathedral. 
The narrator and this motley crew of representative figures of various social classes and occupations travel together and one-up each other in a friendly, sometimes fierce, rivalry of storytelling. During the rising action, the characters ride toward Canterbury, sometimes fighting, sometimes drinking, but taking turns telling their stories as Harry Bailey keeps the momentum going, stopping when the stories get too somber or when the storytellers deviate. The knight tells the first tale, the miller interrupts with the second tale, and so on, until stories are told by a cornucopia of characters. Prologues return to the assembled listeners and develop their characters through reaction and conversation. What follows are stories from the reeve, the cook, the man of law, the shipman, the prioress, Chaucer's caricature of himself who tells his own tale of Sir Topaz and Melibi, the monk, the nun's priest, the physician, the wife of Bath, the friar, the summoner, the clerk, the merchant, the squire, the Franklin, the second nun, the canon's yeoman, and the manciple. The stories are tragedies and comedies. They look at stories that range from mythological, non-secular figures to talking animals, to infidelity and trickery among regular people, even to farting on friars. All speak to the values and beliefs of medieval Europe and burgeoning social classes emerging between the lines of the clergy, the nobility, and the peasantry. The journey's climax sees a stoic parson declare he'll give a sermon, and during the falling action near Canterbury, the parson completes this sermon. It's one that speaks to Christian values, salvation, and offering remedies for the sins that have played out in the various tales throughout the journey. During the resolution, Chaucer, the author, offers his retraction, praying for forgiveness for the less moral moments in the storytelling journey and apologizing for any sensibilities of morality he's offended in his readers. He then includes a list of his own works and a hope for salvation as a kind of final legacy. All throughout the epic that is the Canterbury Tales, themes like love, sex, and fellowship, social class, the relationship between story and storyteller, and rivalry are represented through critical symbols like springtime and flowers, each of which speaks to sexuality, youth, and fertility. Blood, which speaks to the duality of nobility and Christ's sacrifices. And clothing, which is character and class exposition nearly on the level of the tales themselves. Both a lens to medieval culture and a masterwork of poetic prose, one of the first ever in English. Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is an epic in layers where storytelling leads to more storytelling. Symbols uncover themes. Characterization and exposition illuminate the realities of the past. And religious mystique meets the documentation of all too human cultural history.